creating an asthma club they had founded together in the 30s. Then they posed for photographs, the first they believed ever taken of them together. In the photograph that appeared in the Observer several days later, Groucho is telling a joke, cigar in hand while Sid seems convulsed by what he is hearing. They both appear to be having a wonderful time, although years later, shortly before his death, Groucho told one of his biographers, biographers, Charlotte Chandler, I once did an interview with Sid Perlman for a London paper, and I thought it was the dullest interview ever done with two men who were supposed to be funny because we were trying to punch each other. It's not funny to see people trying too hard. The luncheon at the Canal was the last time Groucho ever spoke well of Perlman in public. In interview after interview in the late 60, 1960s until his death in 1977, he expressed only contempt for the writer he had once greatly admired. The best writers for us were George S. Kaufman and Maury Riskind, he told Bert Perlutsky of the Los Angeles Times. The worst, strangely enough, was S.J. Perlman. He could write funny for the New Yorker, but not for the Marx Brothers. In another interview with Robert Altman, John Carroll, and Michael Goodman, he zeroed in on what he felt was Sid's real shortcoming as a writer. He wasn't a dramatist. He could write funny dialogue, and that's very different from writing drama. For that, we needed a different kind of writer like Kaufman and Riskant, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Of the I Sing. Groucho's final thoughts on Perlman were summed up in a brilliantly evasive statement in The Groucho File, published a year before his death. In recent years, the press has concocted a feud between S.J. Perlman and me, but no such feud existed. Sid was often has often been asked about writing for the Marx Brothers, and I have often answered questions about his contributions to our films. What Sid and I both agree on is that he is a great writer, with a brilliant comic mind that didn't always mesh well with the lunacies of the Marx Brothers. What happened to change Groucho's mind? At the time of the later interviews, he was past 80, deaf, feeble, and a victim of several strokes. Physical deterioration had stripped him of what few inhibitions he had left, and perhaps he was at least at last able to give vent to a long-suppressed rage, made even more intense because it involved not only his artistic integrity, but that of his alter ego, the comic creation known as Groucho Marx. In fact, it seems plausible to assume that all the time Groucho was writing endearing dedications and exchanging impudent letters with Sid, he was aware of the cruel gossip, the rumor, that he owed a tremendous debt to a man whose literary genius and bizarre humor even physical appearance, he had artfully mimicked. I was doing this kind of comedy long before I met S.J. Perlman, he once said defensively. Alastair Cook remembers taking his daughter, Susie, to Groucho's one-man show at the Huntington Hartford Museum in New York in the early 1960s. Groucho sang funny songs, mostly written by Harry Ruby, a man many people thought was one of the funniest men who ever lived. That night, Ruby accompanied Groucho on the piano, Groucho told the audience that Ruby looked like a dishonest Abraham Lincoln. As Ruby sat, just sat there, the butt of Groucho's jokes, many of which were Ruby's handiwork. When we went to the show, I had totally forgotten that about one or two months before, Groucho had given all his letters to the Library of Congress, Cook says. I was then the chief American correspondent for The Guardian, for which I had written a piece when the donation was announced. It was very friendly, very much a bully for Groucho piece, but I added that there should be only one condition. If the Library of Congress accepted Groucho's letters and movie scripts, it also ought to take the letters of S.J. Perlman, since Groucho Marx was a creation of S.J. Perlman, and Groucho's letters were probably written by Perlman. It was a joke, but Groucho was uh, remarkably unsusceptible to jokes on him. Susie and I had enjoyed the show very much and Groucho's frailty added to the absurdity of the songs. We went backstage, and he was in a flaming temper. He said, I ought to have you thrown out. And I said, What are you t talking about, Groucho? I was really quite honestly innocent at that point, until he said, I got that piece of yours sent from London about my work in the movies with Sid Perlman. And he said, You know, Sid Perlman never wrote a line of my letters. He went on and on and on. Groucho, who himself had published humor pieces in College Humor and the, and the New Yorker, may have been jealous of Sid's literary fame. Sid was lionized in the press, while other writers such as George S. Kaufman, who had worked for the Marx Brothers and given Groucho his walk and his talk, were not given as much credit. Undoubtedly, Groucho had tired of reading analyses of his films that attributed most 
of the best lines to Perlman, such as, I'd horsewhip you if I had a horse, from Horse Feathers, a line actually written by Harry Ruby. Nat Perrin, who worked on a number of Marx Brothers films, feels that despite all of Groucho's cracks about Perlman's screenwriting talent, Groucho respected him enormously. Perrin feels that it wasn't so much that Groucho was anti-Perlman, as that he wanted to make sure another of his writers, Arthur Sheikman, a very close friend with whom he had done several books, received as much credit as Perlman for his contribution to Marx Brothers' films. In fairness to Sid, it must be said that it must be said he never claimed to have written most of the Marx Brothers' films single-handedly. In countless interviews, he was careful to set the record straight, disclaiming authorship for Animal Crackers and Duck Soup by stressing that the only two films he had worked on had been written in collaboration. When a reporter tried to quiz him on which lines he had written, he demurred, saying that it was so long ago he had totally forgotten. In 1974, he told Howard Kissel, the Marx Brothers movies were really community efforts. They themselves were so anarchic. They sought advice and help from every possible quarter. It's impossible to trace the actual authorship of those films. Groucho, of course, held sway over Sid Wright from the start. In 1931, he was one of America's top entertainers, a star with an entourage, a person in a position to say, it stinks, and have sycophantic writers trying to make it right. For Perlman, an egotist who disliked taking orders, it wasn't so much Groucho's capriciousness and ungrateful attitude that he disliked as his dominance. Groucho may also have been too much like himself. Sid had always had a poor self-image. He imagined himself shorter and punier, punier than he was, and was always conscious about a scar below one ear. He would never permit himself to be photographed from any angle that might reveal it. If Nathaniel West, tall, well-built, well-built and handsome, was his idealized physical self, then Groucho, homely, short, and nearsighted, represented the self-image he despised. It was as though he were looking at himself in a mirror, hating what he saw. If their physical resemblance was startling, so were their personalities. Both were slight and dapper, with toothbrush mustaches. Groucho, whose grease paint mustache had been his trademark for years, grew a real one for his appearance on the radio version of You Bet Your Life in 1947. Clean-shaven for years, Perlman grew a mustache in the 1950s. Neither ate or drank to excess. Both were moody, temperamental, hostile, yet, when the occasion demanded it, capable of disarming charm and dazzling wit. Both were intensely private, loath to reveal their in inmost feelings, men who used their wit as a shield against a world they distrusted. I am a serious man with a comic sense, Groucho once said. It could have been said by Sid. Outwardly, though, their behavior was very different. Sid was shy and withdrawn, while Groucho was brash, fast-talking, a show-off who, who felt compelled to twist everything said to him into a joke at someone's expense. Yet many of Groucho's friends felt this was a facade. Basically, he was shy and romantic, although he would rather have died than admit it. Both Sid and Groucho were haunted by the specter of poverty. Neither spent a cent unless it was absolutely necessary. Perlman constantly worried about money. He rarely took cabs and seldom gave presents. While Grouch was always fearful, he would be penniless in his old age. Whenever he dined at a fashionable Hollywood restaurant, he always parked his car several blocks away to avoid having to tip the parking lot attendant. Married and divorced, three times he was furious if his wives bought anything without his permission and he refused to let his children take piano or ballet lessons because he considered them an unnecessary expense. Both Sid and Groucho were hopeless Anglophiles, filled with a romantic yearning for England in the glorious days of Queen Victoria. Perhaps the precariousness and drabness of their parents' lives as immigrants drew them to this sentimental notion. Or, perhaps by identifying themselves with English culture, they hoped to forget their peasant origins. 